Please let me know um, if you are in chat, if um, you can hear us all right. I hope so. Um, I'm so excited for today's episode of Power Word Talk. And if you're new to Power Word Talk, we are going to be having introspective discussions with phenomenal writers, artists, and creators to discuss their personal journeys and their amazing work that leaves a positive impact on our community. I'm your host, Utahime. And uh, before we get uh, to chat with our magnificent guest, aka the birthday boy for today, <laughs> I'm going to do our usual uh, brief shout outs. Um, as you guys may or may not know, I am the community manager here at Cyber Nation Uncensored. And I would like to mention we have a very, very active community and Discord. Um, I put the links in the chat. Uh, so we would love to have you join us. Uh, it's a full of amazingly wonderful people who also to uh, share the same love for pretty much cyberpunk and all things dystopian and uh, TTRPG related. Uh, but be sure to also follow us on our different social media pages. Uh, we have quite a, quite a few. We have Twitch, YouTube, we got our podcast. You can find pretty much anywhere. Uh, so we try to make sure that that stays up to date, um, especially because we have so many new amazing shows that we've brought to um, our uh, Cyber Nation Uncensored family. So we want you guys to be able to enjoy that. We do try to keep that uh, active and we try to keep that updated so definitely definitely be sure to follow and like subscribe uh rate those podcasts do the thing we we appreciate uh all the love and support you guys have shown us also too we got to shout out our awesome official sponsors our partners let me make sure that i put that link up here in chat there we go uh we have our official sponsors uh sirenscape Fantasy Grounds, Studio Gate, um, Modifius Entertainment, Lion Banner, and Lake Battle Maps. Uh, lastly, of course, I cannot not mention our amazing Patreon subscribers because without your amazing support, we wouldn't be able to bring you all the awesome content <laughs> that we're able to on a weekly basis. So we truly appreciate you guys. And um, I'll be keeping an eye out um, in chat as I usually do, uh, just for any questions, any comments that you might have for our special guests. But let's go ahead and get right on into it, guys, because oh, today, man. today, I have the insanely talented Trevor Valley with us, guys. It's an absolute honor, first of all, to have you on the show. But the fact that you're sharing your special day, it's your birthday, and you decided to sit down with little old me and now, to, uh, chat to, today. To be fair, you asked like one night after Leverage LA and I'm just like, yeah, sure. And I looked at the date and I'm like, yeah, fuck it, let's go. And it wasn't until like a couple days ago and I'm like, by the way, it's my birthday. Oh. I was like, you you don't mind? You don't mind sharing no, your all. special day with me? No, no, no. Let me get drunk later tonight, it'll be fun. <laughs> Right now it's two o'clock. It's L.A. I'm just like, yeah, no, let's do this. Let's do this. Yes. And, I mean, obviously, you're a good friend of mine. Uh, for those who don't know, I, he already mentioned it. Uh, he runs uh, our awesome Leverage L.A. game over on Open Circuit Studios. He's our director for that show. And I mean, I can't keep up with all the epic stuff. Whenever I look online, you're doing so much. But okay, for those who may not be aware, let's do a proper introduction. <laughs> uh, please tell the viewers who have not had an opportunity or the, the privilege to, to get to know you yet, uh, <sighs> who you are, your pronouns, and uh, just a little bit about yourself. Just a little bit, because we got we're going to dive into it soon. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm Trevor Valley. I'm a professional dungeon master. I'm on other people's things like this. Um, and uh, I go by, uh, uh, I have he, him pronouns. And yeah, I've done a lot for a long time. <laughs> like a whole lot and uh yeah today i'm uh two years out of 50. so yeah I'm, I'm old stop it no we, we don't we I'm won't say that here you are young okay, okay fine i'm vivacious. young at heart <laughs> but yeah i do some streams here online uh here on twitch uh and you can see some of them over on youtube on a whole bunch of different networks and uh yeah um i'm 
also paleontologist, a former wildlife biologist, and National Geographic uh, documentary guy. So, And that's exactly where we're going to start. Because oh, first of all, okay, I would like to just make it clear. Uh, because I literally don't know anyone, anyone other than maybe if we're talking about Ross Geller from Friends. And he I don't doesn't care. That doesn't count. I was about he to say that. Count. I was about to say that. It doesn't count. But literally, you you don't come across people who are paleontologists often, especially also to a wildlife biologist. So we need to go back, <laughs> go back to the beginning, rewind a little bit. I want you to talk to us about how that came about. Like, were you just as a kid, like super into dinosaurs? Like, I want to know, <laughs> and I'm sure other people want to know because it's really, really awesome and amazing. This is where everything goes sideways and <laughs> like really quick. Uh, no, I was never into dinosaurs. I like dinosaurs weren't really my thing um at all i like really? going to the yeah I, I like going to the natural history museum in la and the tar pits and i thought it was really cool but um ever since i was very very young and it was uh actually i was i was six it was 1981 and i saw the space shuttle columbia lift off for the first time my mom my mom took me out of school i, I got to stay home that day and every subsequent shuttle launch I well, I was able to watch at home if it was being televised. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to fly the space shuttle. I wanted to be the space shuttle commander. I wanted to be in the left seat. I want to be the guy that when it goes up, when it comes down, that's the dude or yeah. the woman or them. I wanted to be them. Mm -hmm. I went to space camp. I'm a four-time space camp alumni. That is space so camps. cool. Yeah, space camp, space academy, space academy level two. Wait, how do you apply for space camp? camp? I'm just, just curious. Well, you, just... You, <laughs> pen, you spend some money and you go. They also have adult classes. It's a three-day um, thing, and you get to get locked into the six-degree chair and uh, do the uh, do the shuttle uh, simulator and all that. It's a hell of a lot of fun. But yeah, I that did all like that. Fun. Um, but then everything was kind of cut short and I didn't get to do that. So in, when I decided to go to college, uh, at first I wanted to be a, uh, I wanted to be an MD. I wanted to be a medical doctor, specifically okay. a trauma surgeon okay. and mm -hmm. wasn't really cut out for that because they said I had no bedside manner. And I explained to them that you don't have to have bedside manner if you're a trauma surgeon. But then I switched to biology, and I became a biologist, focusing on herpetology, the study of reptiles and amphibians, and a little bit of marine biology, because I really like sharks. <laughs> um, so, like, here I am, a biologist. At this time, probably, I think it was 2005, 2005-ish, I was working at the Aquarium in the Pacific in Long Beach, and I was working in an exhibit called Dazzling and Dangerous, which was a series of animals um, from deserts and things like that and from uh, land surrounding the Pacific that, like, very few people know that the winds that come off the deserts actually drop essential nutrients into the Pacific Ocean. No, I, I did for, not know that. Yeah, and it's really cool. And there was this whole exhibit, like, with rattlesnakes and all that and herpetologists. I'm like, cool, <laughs> I'll help feed all that. I got to know the living collections people at NHM. Mm -hmm. at the Natural History Museum of L.A. County. And then I left the aquarium, and on the way home, I got a call from the Living Collections Department of the museum. They are like, hey, do you want a job? I'm like, I just resigned my position at the aquarium. Sure. So I went into the live ant Living Collections Department and the Education Department, and was teaching classes and doing camps and doing tours, developing curriculum. And then the Dinosaur Institute said, hey, you know bones. Um, do you want to start cleaning dinosaurs part time? I'm like, sure. I'll like pick things off of like <laughs> dirt off of bones and the whole thing. Yeah. Learned how to do preparation. And then in 2008, they're like, in September of 2008, they're like, cool. Um, we're sending you to the tar pits and you're going to be the assistant lab supervisor there. You're going to be uh, looking over a staff of 70. 70. Yeah, all volunteer oh staff. Was that with, the, the biggest uh, team that you've ever had ever, to supervise? Ever, ever, yeah. And then I became the lab supervisor after a couple of years, and then I went into field paleontology, and I'm a what's called a mitigation paleontologist. Whenever there's construction okay. going on in the state of California and a few neighboring states, mm -hmm. 
um, you have to have a biological monitor, an archaeological monitor, and a paleontological monitor there in case something is discovered, disturbed, or otherwise uncovered. Uh, it's state law. And so that's what I do. I'm contracted through various environmental firms and sent out in the middle of nowhere or possibly even in downtown L.A. Mm -hmm. to watch exceedingly large, dangerous machines move dirt and then tell them all to stop and go home when they do something like in downtown L.A., discover a whale rib cage that's Wait, did that actually happen? Old. Yeah. Really? Yeah, fossil coral reef. Was of, that recently? Uh, or? Um, that was 2000. If, no, 15, I think. Wow. Maybe 2015. I'd already come back from Siberia. Okay. So then I went to a different company. Yeah, I think it was like 2015. But we I love found how casual it's like, I already came back. I came back from Siberia. Well, that, so 2013, <laughs> 2014, the Siberian expedition is kind of where my mind goes. Yeah. Just because of, we'll get into that later, oh, how sure. my mind yeah. works. <laughs> um, that's my, that's my marker point. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so I believe it's 2015. We found a fossil coral reef, a whale rib cage, and about 400 shark teeth, including one of the few instances of uh, megalodon that have been found in the Los Angeles basin. So specifically, amazing. actually, this tooth that's on my arm, I had, wait, no, uh, fucker. Uh, <laughs> There we go. And if now you guys you didn't get it, yeah. the, the, the yeah. social media handle for our, our guest is Tattoos and Bones. Yeah. So it's, it's it's on brand, guys. It's on brand. Yeah, I'm a tattooed paleontologist, so that's how that works. So, yeah, I like to say I sideloaded into paleontology. Um, yeah, like it's so like definitely I, I just assumed. But, again, you can never assume anything. But the yeah. fact that it was like it started out with space and then ended up going. I just find that so interesting. That it ended up going into that. Um, I also t it's, this is a really random one for me. But is there a specific like lizard or snake or is one that's your favorite? Like I, I'm just curious oh, if yes. you have a favorite. Um, uh, again, I don't know if you can see it. I'll kind of do. Yes. It's uh, the horned uh, the horned lizards of the desert southwest, the Fernosoma genus. Specifically, Those are the ones that really blend right into their environment. Yeah, th some people call them horny toads. They're mm -hmm. they're not toads. They're lizards, so they're horned lizards. They're so cute. Um, this one, this um, the Solari species, is known as the regal horned lizard. It has a full crown of spikes on its head, and they're also cool because one of their primary one of their primary defenses is they puff out. They have um, a uh, a very uh, easily expandable rib cage because of their cartilage. So they puff out and become this big flat disc that's hard to eat, and they turn sideways. But if it's so specifically a canid, like a like a, a canine, like a fox or a coyote or wild dog, mm -hmm. they actually <laughs> it's called auto hemorrhaging. They purposely overpressure small blood vessels in their eye socket to burst, and they can shoot a stream of blood upwards of six feet. Oh and they aim for the predator's mouth. And what? their diet is ants. The formic acid in the ants makes their blood taste incredibly bitter. So it's like, you don't want me. You don't want to eat yeah. me. I'm yeah. gross. Don't want to eat gross me. Taste. <laughs> yeah. And then the, uh, then Crazy. it has. Survival. A, Survival. Yeah. It's, it's it, so interesting. And it has a high, uh, a high percentage of um, efficacy for it, too. Uh, it's it's really cool, but they're they're my absolute favorite lizard, um, like just general lizard. That and estuarian or saltwater crocodiles, because they're just awesome. <laughs> you know, they shake, they create a meat rainbow. Yeah, it's very cool. That's awesome. Now I have some photos which I'm going to show, um, but, but first let me take a what? look. I, yes, photos. Yes, photos. Oh my oh, gosh. Shit. But before Wait, I do am that, I allowed to, am I allowed to swear on this network? Yes. Yes. You okay. Can. Cool. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we we do that a lot sometimes with some of the cyberpunk games on the channel. Um, let's see. But like cyberpunk's in the evening. This is like you know, this <laughs> after is dark. In I the know, UK, like they call it before the watershed. <laughs> um, so somebody did ask. Okay, we had Robert uh, who asked, "Do you use drones in your line of work?" Uh, I do not specifically. Um, I have before when we're doing a very large survey. We primarily use it to see what the geology is like in the area, but topographically. So 
if we're doing a transect survey where there's 25 of us spread out and we're walking for, I don't know, seven to 10 acres mm -hmm. at a time and mapping all that out, it's good to take an overview. We will use satellite photography, drone photography. We also do, um, for before drones became prevalent, we would use balloons that are tethered to four corners with a camera on it, with a remote shutter okay. to go over a, uh, if it's a large enough quarry site, we would do that. But usually if we're taking a top-down photo, it's one poor soul on the, on the top of a very tall ladder. And that so was scary. never me. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, mm, yeah, we'll leave that to the other guy. <laughs> but yeah, it. drones drones are used, um, but not necessarily for like advanced mapping or anything like that. It's kind of like, so what's on the other side of this large prickly bush thing that's blocking our way? That kind of deal. Got you. Hopefully that answers your question, Robert. Uh, we're going kind of further into this like track of the, the different sites that you've worked. And I, again, we're gonna now we're gonna go over to our photos here. And I, right, I think me, you guys can me, still hear us. Yeah, um, let me move the zoom into the other window so I can see. Oh dear God. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I want to talk about some, you know, because you shared with me some of your awesome photos from your time in the field. And you've also done appearances in different various like documentaries or shows like on National Geographic. I want to know about some of those notable uh, appearances. And I think some of them might be pictured here. Um, uh, the very first one where, oh, hey, that's my <laughs> that, that that's my truck. Um, <laughs> that's like literally how dirty it gets. Um, on the, the, the truck is blue. <laughs> Um, in that instance, it's brown. So the very first picture, it was me on a ferry with a film crew in my face. That was during the, and um, actually the one that's up right now uh, is also the same uh, documentary. That is my National Geographic documentary, um, uh, Mammoths Unearthed. We spent eight weeks uh, traveling across Russia into Siberia, searching for a uh, frozen woolly mammoth carcass, a very specific one called the Lyakovsky mammoth, in which they were supposedly, they had supposedly found uh, liquid blood flowing out when they did, uh, when, when they were carving it out of the ice on the Lyakovsky Islands. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it in case you find the, the, uh, the documentary, but it was a it was an amazing trip, eight weeks, because I'm primarily, when it comes to paleontology, I'm primarily California and other neighboring states. And like I go into Utah, mm -hmm. Montana, things like that as well, but those are badlands. It's scrub brush. It's all that. This was at the end of August, beginning of September. So just as the weather is changing, just as the white nights are ending, there was a, for three days, um, I, I didn't really sleep well for three days because at anywhere between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. was the same amount of light in the sky. It never got fully dark. Ooh. Yeah, yeah it was I, rough. I tried to go camping in Joshua Tree, and I remember just the sun just bearing mm. down and how difficult it was at it was like 5 a.m. How difficult it was to try to. I'm like, I don't want to wake up yet. But the sun is so bright. I, I can't imagine like if it's just never dark. Yeah, it's just below the horizon. So it's nautical twilight, which is still like you can read a book easily by that amount of light. And the, win the window shades wouldn't close all the way in the tiny little house in like random. Oh, what was the name of that town? Um... Kazachie? No, it was Kligia. No, it was Deputatsky. Um, in Deputatsky, it was, yeah, I couldn't sleep. So I became very grumpy. But we traveled uh, in the span of less, or just less than a day. I flew from Los Angeles, it was from Los Angeles to London, got a final round of vaccines in London then flew to Moscow. We had a layover of six hours, and then we flew from Moscow completely across Russia to the Saka Republic in a 
uh, a city called Yakutsk, which is the capital of Yakutia, which is a subregion in eastern Siberia. And that's when it started. And at that point, uh, it was kind of crazy. I was closer to home at that point in the expedition than I have been at any other point other than leaving. Wow. Yeah, I, I came within 2,000 nautical miles of my own apartment when I was in Russia. It, it, I nearly went all the way around the world. It was fucking crazy. That's crazy. And yeah, it was very hot on some days. Then there was an Arctic thunderstorm. We used Soviet-era all-terrain vehicles, um, like armored all-terrain vehicles to go places, helicopters, repelling, all to try and find uh, at least this one mammoth, which turned out to be somewhere completely different than we anticipated, but uh, to discover other things. And yeah, I found bones and tusks and all sorts of all sorts of crazy stuff. And it was, it was a very, it was a life changing adventure because I'm in these very, very poor economic situation, mm -hmm. tiny little Eastern Russian towns with a national geographic budget. So we go into their market and the team starts like grabbing things and all that. Meanwhile, I see this woman buying bread by the slice. By the slice. By the slice. So I start telling the crew that we need to put a lot of that back. And then in extremely shitty half Russian English, I asked when their next shipment was coming in and it was in two days on Thursday. So I'm like, nope, we are getting a block of cheese, like one egg a piece and like this half chicken. And that's yeah. it because we wow. cannot buy out this entire town worth of food. And yeah, it was, it was an interesting experience to go through all of that. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't really have time to process it because after, after y Yakutsk is a very, it's, it's the capital. So like mm -hmm. down the street was a Russian version of a Burger King and you could get Miller genuine draft, you know, all that kind of stuff. But then we went into the, the, the nowhere's lands. Yeah. And then from when we flew all the way back to St. Petersburg, then I went North into the Amal Peninsula where the Nanette peoples are and they are reindeer herders and they've been reindeer herders for about the last 50 to 80,000 years. Wow. They've constantly been That's inhabiting cool. this area. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I'm in like the hardcore rustic part of the expedition and we find more mammoth bones and everything. And they have a whole mythology built on mammoths. It was fascinating. And then we ended the expedition early because we'd figured everything out. So they gave me three days in Paddington uh, outside of London. And I had such a culture shift that I spent the entire three days hammered. I just could not handle the yeah. shift from what had happened to that. And then I get home and I get to my apartment and I had emptied my fridge because I was going to be gone for mm -hmm. so long. I went to my local supermarket, my local Ralph's. And the excess I saw, I had a near nervous breakdown or panic attack. Like a woman oh, yeah. grabbed an apple and like five others fell onto the floor. She kind of pushed them aside and took her cart around to pick up some arugula or whatever the hell it was. And I'm just looking at this going, I was literally just in five separate towns that would freak out walking into this produce thing. Like, yeah, they don't totally, see that. They, that's yeah. not a, uh, accessible for them. Yeah, it's that's it's not a thing. Man, that's um, insane to think about. And it's it, yeah. it makes you truly grateful for all the things that sometimes we take for granted, I feel, <laughs> every day. It, it does. And it's just because I'd spent so long there. Like, I've been in the poorer sections <laughs> of uh, Israel or in Central and South America. But it wasn't for any decent length of time like that. Two or three days. I'm like, I'm in, like, I'm traveling through Ecuador to get to Quito to work on some, like, some sloth remains in a tar pit down there. But we're staying at a nice, you know, a, a, you know, a nice casita and everything's cool. But everything's kind of on the, on the periphery. Yeah. I was in Ustkwegia and Deputatsky and Kazachie and these old Soviet mining towns 
that once there was no more coal, everybody left, like with populations of 700 and you're only seeing like 30 of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was, it was just, it was life altering and it was, uh, yeah, it was a hell, it was a hell of an expedition. And then I I found out that, I mean, the director is a good friend of mine, but then I found out he also directed things like gold rush and like American pickers and stuff like that. So they turned the documentary into like a very like, these two scientists are having a difficult time finding this mammoth and tensions rise. And there's like me yelling at my co-host <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. And yeah, it wasn't the way I would have cut it, but it was yeah. still. Especially with everything that you guys experienced and, and, and yeah. saw. For yeah, sure. it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was a wild time. That's. That's probably my, I mean, it was definitely my longest expedition I've ever done. The, anything before that was only like four to five weeks in Montana and Hill Creek uh, and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it was, it was life altering. Even to this day, like I order just enough groceries to make it like a week or two. That's it. I make sure nothing spoils. I use everything. If it's past its expiration date, you do the smell and taste test. If you don't get sick, fucking use it. Yeah, I, I, I feel like we try to do that in our house where if there's leftovers, unless it's just really spoiled and we can't make use out of it in some way, that's the only time we'll tr- kind of throw it out. You know, it's like, hmm, is this milk? Let me taste it real quick. Just make sure yeah. that it's like still okay. Not going to make us sick. Good. All right, we're good to go. Right. It's like, okay, I've had this potato salad for a week. <laughs> And it says sell by date from three days ago, but it's still sealed and it's been cold the whole time. Pull it open. Yeah, no, we're good. <laughs> but it's yeah. again the culture, like different things culturally that we we seem to for, we can forget or take for granted. Um, oh, yeah. But also too, like getting into the more cu- cultural side of things because some people may not know you're Spanish and Jewish. Yeah, yeah. Um, I... And, you know, they, they may not know that about you, but as far as, like, culture and, like, growing up and, you know, were you, were you surrounded around both of those cultures equally or, you know, how, um, what was that like for you? Not really. Um, I mean, Jewish, yes. Um, uh, being Spanish and of, uh, like, of mainland Spain, Hispanic ancestry. Um, not really. I am incredibly white passing i have used that to my advantage um to get out of everything from plane tickets to not being searched at an airport um growing up my dad's side of the family were basque nationals from navarra um grandfather born in jalisco but they were told that in order to get places in america they should change their name from dubai from dubai and not even use the more uh, Latinized uh, mm-hmm. Mexican Valle to Valley. And my dad grew up with that kind of situation. So when he came out to California and met a, you know, a little Jewish girl from Canada, uh, it stayed Valley. And I was wow. grown up. Uh, I grew up Valley and mm-hmm. Trevor Valley and always last on the roll in uh, high school and all that. And then on a whim, I started looking in the phone book to see yeah. how many valleys were there. Mm-hmm. And I saw there were Del Valle, there were Del Valles, there were Divalles, there were valleys, some with um, um, uh, 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 some with accents yeah. on the E, some without. And I started noticing because back then, kids, we had a white pages. That would yes. have people's phone numbers and addresses in them. And those big the um, yellow pages that you could just like literally knock someone out with, just throw it. Oh yeah. And like I'm I'm a native Angelino. Mm-hmm. Uh I was born in San Fernando Valley. I've lived on both sides of the hill. Right now I live in Hollywood. And I started looking at and like pulling out the Thomas Guide maps and seeing that these people lived in like uh eighth and Ivar, like in Koreatown yeah. or in South Central or in uh in the area i'm in now very heavily hispanic neighborhoods and i started asking questions yeah and i started getting answers and i didn't 
like the fact that I wasn't I, I wasn't presenting who I really was. Mm -hmm. So in later high school, I started really enforcing it on teachers and my friends. Uh, in college, I did. But then I started finding out that if you have a Hispanic last name and you are Spanish, um, and if you are also Jewish, if you don't speak Spanish or Hebrew, there's a lot of ostr you know, uh, ostracizing that goes on. Like I didn't, I haven't, I didn't learn Hebrew until, God, like 2017. I'm still like okay with it. Yeah. Um, I never had a bar mitzvah. Uh, we were Jewish in my household, mm -hmm. but yeah. like I, I, we we never did anything for like any major Spanish holiday. We didn't do anything like that. The closest we got was having two Thanksgivings. Um, thanks to mom being from Canada, Canadian Thanksgiving is October 10th and American Thanksgiving is whenever the hell it lands in November. So lots of food, just, just Lo all Oh my food. God, from October. So like beginning of October, my, so mom's birthday in September, my, uh, then Canadian Thanksgiving, then my birthday, then Thanksgiving, then Christmas, just like stop. <laughs> Also, um, too, uh, we have a minstrel's tale who says, happy birthday to you. Oh, there were some other birthday yay. wishes, too. Oh, sweet. Right on. But, yeah, it was yeah. it was interesting to go from a very white-facing upbringing to a very multicultural one. And, sure. yeah, and even today it's interesting, again, like in the TTRPG world, when you look at me and you look at my, like, and you look at the resumes, sure. I'm like, Trevor Valley has been playing role-playing games for 40 plus years. Which we're going to get into. That's the, that's, that's yeah. what we're transitioning into. After but this. immediately look, look at the package. Yeah. Bald, gray bearded white guy who has been playing games for 40 years. I am knee jerked and I totally get it. And I agree with it into what is the problem with the role-playing game sphere is the fucking old school grognards gatekeeping sons of bitches. Right. And I hate them, but I get it you get, you because yeah. that's, that's what I look like. And yeah, I'm, uh, I'm coming to a lot of terms now that I've lost members of my family and right. I'm an only child. So like no genes get passed from me and this late in life, I'm really starting to embrace it. And I will yeah. proudly stand with uh, with Latinx, Hispanic, uh, both uh, uh, okay. North American, Central and Southern American uh, Latinx communities, mainland Spain communities, uh, Jewish communities, the LBGT community, because I am very loudly and proudly mm -hmm. bisexual. Yeah, it's it's time that I use yeah. this kind of face front privilege to talk about shit that more people can talk about. And so that means I get to get into those privileged fucking conversations and go, Hey, other white people, guess what? Motherfucker. <laughs> and <laughs> like, surprise. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's that blade behind, uh, behind <laughs> the twilight meme. It's like surprise motherfucker. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And I get to use it instead of for yeah. my benefit for others. And yeah, I really good. enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. Use use it use it for good, not for mediocre. For sure. Or for evil. Yeah, and I I good. really I really uh I really appreciate that I can do that now. You know, that's amazing. And, and also yeah, embracing those parts of who you are. Because I I've I've talked yeah. about that uh on previous uh, Power Word talks where it's kind of, uh, you know, not feeling like you have to hold those parts of yourself and like really embracing every, like all of like what you are, not only as far as culturally, but also to when it comes to fandoms and uh, what you're, you're passionate about. And yeah. you do that, and that's that's what I, I, I love. I've, se I've seen you basically go in and be like, hold on real quick let me let me check that what you just said and, and it's important to to really use that again your influence if you have it 
for for a, a good cause and that's what you're doing which is awesome. and and i do it across different platforms i, I not only in tabletop role playing but against science denial mm -hmm. you know people are like evolution is just a theory or the world is flat or any of that bullshit uh i step in both fists swinging because like for for too long across all different aspects of life misinformation misogyny racism bigotry uh you know uh over marginalization of uh marginalization of peoples it's gone on too fucking long we should have my generation gen x should have nipped this shit in the bud in the 80s and 90s and we tried but there just weren't enough of us now i'm taking up that slack and i'm just i'm wading into everything it's like fuck you i have twenty thousand followers on twitter and a verified account i will step into these rings and call you out and not caring because... too about whether or not you lose some followers for speaking oh no not at all things. oh i've torpedoed my account a handful of times <laughs> um because of uh because of <laughs> stupid choices in the past and shitty podcasts i was on in the past which will not be named yeah we will not we will um, not even touch on that but yeah, I to I because a shit ton of followers followed me from those kinds of things, and I'm just like, by the way, this guy sucks. Fuck you if you don't like that. Leave or yeah. I block you. Yeah. There you go. You're speaking I the have truth. remove follower. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just say speaking yeah. of which I'm trending? No, don't say that. <laughs> That's terrifying. Oh my goodness. I I, I can I only also imagine. Hate, I'm like, oh. Ugh. No, I hate I hate fame. I hate talking about myself. This is a very rare thing, and I only do it because I love you and trust you implicitly. Yes. Well, I'm, that means a lot to me because I, I want everyone who comes on the show to feel comfortable and to be able to be their authentic selves and not have to be like, hello, I am Trevor Valley. Nice to, you know, you know, it's like just being genuine and just being able to be open and, and feeling comfortable and safe, which everyone should feel like they have a safe place to share things like what you've been sharing with us today. So I, I really appreciate the fact that you are you willing to talk about, I know that you don't like talking about yourself, even though I feel like I'm just so honored to have a friend who is so multi-talented and doing so many amazing things and also speaking out uh, against certain things that we see on a daily basis. Uh, but going back to what you mentioned, because mm. that is very impressive, especially for someone who is fairly new like as far as recent years to tabletop 40 years yeah there's nothing was... to sneeze at so we need to figure out how how did in addition to space camp <laughs> how did <laughs> tabletop and getting involved in that in and and the, the tabletop space how did that come about uh huh, and like what systems because i'm curious if you had a, if it was dungeons and dragons or if it was something else oh it was a lot uh i just noticed in chat i think it's chicago lycanthrope Yes. Francois. <laughs> uh, uh, or, uh, Francois. Uh, uh, no, uh, parlez little Quebecois. Um, uh, French Canadian. Uh, very, very fucking little. Little. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Spanish, un poquito. Um, uh, Russian, nemoga. Yeah, it's just like little bits of here and there, just enough to get by. Um, yeah, by I'm the really way, don't bad. speak, I'm really yeah, bad. Don't speak I don't Quebecois know in France. You will be treated like shit um yeah because they're just like oh anyway uh yeah 40 oh God, that's a whole nother discussion ago. about that yeah. and that's like a whole uh, other thing 40 40 cough clear throat years ago um my uncle in uh 19 in 1974 and 1977 got like the original D, &D show i'm talking like the original white OG. box D, D stuff the old old og stuff and started getting the uh like the basic set in 1983 um actually well the original basic set was 1977 and then it was revised in 1981 when it came out and i'm also a dungeons and dragons historian by the way but we'll get into that maybe <laughs> never anyway uh it's like, the you know everything about like the like reptiles and lizards uh bones and i have a whole them. nerd night ted talk on the history <laughs> of dungeons and dragons um wizards of the coast if you're watching hi um <laughs> So I was, uh, uh, I was very young, and my uncle showed me the 1981 revision of the red box set of Dungeons and Dragons. I'm like, there's a dragon and a wizard 
undercover and I want to play this game. It's like a board game, right? <laughs> and it's like, no, it takes place in your mind. And I play a few games mm -hmm. and I start to get it and I understand it. And then I start to realize that other friends also want to play it. So I like borrow his books and we go stumble through it. And then by the time I'm 10, I have a regular game going with wow. some of my at some 10? of my school friends at 10. That's amazing. Now, um, were you we're, running we're, that one? We were taking turns DMing. That's amazing. I love that. And I followed D&D &D through every edition until even up until fifth. And and the uh, when it was back when it was uh, next D and D and now one D and D which will be five point five or maybe even six in some year. Mm -hmm. um, I followed every edition of Dungeons and Dragons. It's been my primary game. Okay. But other systems, GURPS, Champion, Palladium, uh, Palladium role playing system, the Hero system, the original Marvel, the original DC, mm. Star Trek. Star Wars role playing game, Paranoia, Top Secret, Star Frontiers. <laughs> um, God. The better question would be like, what haven't you played? That's that. that's a better <laughs> one because I've even done like offshoot stuff like Alternity and Seventh C. I was oh, one of the cool. original play testers for the Mind's Eye Theater, uh, 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 Vampire LARP. Ooh. I was okay. part of the L.A. Camarilla LARP group. And oh the San gosh. Diego Sabat LARP group and all that. I had the single largest vampire LARP running at Universal City Walk at I didn't the time. I know that there was a LARP there. There was a long time ago. Then the LA Sheriff's Department said it got a little weird. <laughs> so we, we, we acquiesced to their request. But uh, yeah, World of Darkness, Call of Cthulhu. Um, uh, I've even like dabbled in Pathfinder a little, mm -hmm. Blades in the Dark, Scum and Villainy. Um, I'm currently in or running three versions of fifth edition Cortex Plus wow. and Scum and Villainy, which is based off uh, Blades in the Dark. Amazing. That's just that's my that's normal like week. <laughs> it's like just normal, just you know, your average week, you know, no yeah, big that, deal. that's yeah, Mondays, I'm in a 1940s noir inspired fifth edition game uh called the sinner's dream on negative two charisma tuesdays i'm on the free forge using the ultra modern five version of fifth edition and become legend wednesday is cortex plus drama with leverage la oh yeah Thir thursday is scum and villainy which is a blaze blades in the dark that's also on negative two charisma and then fridays is either my D, D high fantasy home game or my professional dm games that i run Fridays and Saturdays. So you're not uh, busy. Is, you're not busy at all. No, not at all. No, free time. <laughs> I've got tons. No, today I took, this is the only thing I'm doing. And then I'm, I, I'm, I'm being kidnapped for my birthday later tonight. So I like, I yes. had to pull out of the Classic Cougar live game tonight. And they're just like, happy birthday. Cool. Have fun. I have fun. Um, now I want to know yeah, about these, uh, these characters that you've created because I, I, <laughs> I, I love hearing, like you have the Minotaur gunslinger, you have a yes. lemur. <laughs> yes. um, I, you know, I want to know, cause it's like, obviously, uh, you know, you've been playing for so long. So what is your process like for uh, kind of character creation for these various shows? How do you go about them at this point since you've done um... so many? I'm sure you have like the list of characters you've played. Oh, in, insane! Yeah, it's it's insane, and I try and make each one a little different mm -hmm. because every single character I have run, every character I have run has been some kind of aspect uh, of me or like little bits of my own personality. Lately, probably within the last ten years, yeah. every character I've run is either something I have or some kind of insecurity or kind of thing that I need to get over. Mm -hmm. uh, Mac, my Minotaur gunslinger, literal cowboy on Monday nights, is my former naivete when it came to relationships. I was in a very long-lasting relationship with a severe love-bombing narcissist that would wow. be very manipulative. So Mac 
is my untrusting kind of naive to the world doesn't understand magic or anything fancy is just in his own narrow mindset and easily manipulate you know easily to manipulate mm -hmm. um all he does is one thing is that press a trigger and that's what he's really good at and he's currently having a major crisis of faith another thing that i need to do uh my lemur my vistaya on become legend uh become legend is a ultra modern five fifth edition that's inspired by the world of Runeterra from League of Legends and Arcane. Mm -hmm. I'm playing a Vestaya who takes who takes shape as a lemur. One lemurs, amazing animals. I love <laughs> I love uh, guys like that. But he is my PTSD. Yeah. He is my inner voices. He's my bipolar one rapid cycling that I have. He's a little bit of my OCD. Uh, director James on Leverage LA yes. is just me with a different job on a different timeline. And uh, <laughs> Plastic Cougar is, are my vices. That is Dice Roll. He is a synthetic, mohawked um, uh, bass player. I also mm -hmm. play bass. And Shuttle Pilot, something I never got to do. Yep. But he is completely unhinged. He allows his mania to just go and he is an addict i used to be a massive alcoholic and each of these characters uh, rico uh my grung monk mm -hmm. he is spanish so he talks in this crazy ricardo montalban accent <laughs> I love um that. because he is the overreaching part of my spanish heritage um i have uh, a very kind of i well nemo's voice is yes. kind of like the New Jersey, you know, kind of like a New Jersey Jew, to be honest. You know, it's kind of nasally, and he just kind of does that draw. And, uh, you know, he, he's, you know, really pours so on good. the guilt when he can. And, yeah, each of my characters have been a very deep, deep part of me because I find, one, it's more comfortable yes. to yes. play a character if you're drawing on something very personal mm -hmm. or at least a little bit personal. I agree. And two, I trust my players and the storytellers I choose to interact with to feel safe because feeling yep. safe at a table is important. Oh, it's so important. And if I can get into those kind of spaces and kind of just let myself go as a character or, or a DM, then um, stop calling me. I'm busy. <laughs> um, like not now. Yeah, not now. I'm on a really important But podcast. I feel like those are the characters, too, as a viewer, um, I, I often connect with. Because, you know, it's like different. Also, too, there's always the characters that you're like, oh, that, that's a little bit of me. Like, I, you know, you know, a little bit of what I used to be like when I was younger or currently maybe something you're dealing with. And it's it, it really just hits you yeah. in a different way. You know what I mean? And I, I love that you add that. Because I, I, I try to do a little bit of that myself. Um, each character is different, but they all have different aspects of me, you know, in it. So it feels, like you said, it just, it feels more natural when you're playing these characters and bringing them to life. One I am dying to play, and I hope um, one of my best friends and amazing storyteller that she is, Diana D'Amico, yes, is listening Diana. or will see this at some point, um, or the whole crew so at... Uh, at ATL by night, um, Atlanta by night, they fucking rad. They um, I have completely, if I was raised in Navarra and I became a kindred, I have a La Sombra Corsair, Venacio Jacinto Rodolfo de, Cor de Costa Ortez. I love and that. he is a sailing tall ship, fucking La Sombra, that's just decides to go to the mainland and maybe have a little party sometime. And he is very, very lovely. Until you cross him, then he just pulls out his sword and he slits your throat. <laughs> um, very, that. yeah, he's, he's very um, uh, Luigi Vampa from uh, uh, the, um, not Man in the Iron Mask, it's the other one. Fuck! Oh, uh, I'm forgetting. Oh. Count, uh, Count of Monte Cristo. Mm, yes. Um, 
Yeah, and he's just that kind of swashbuckler, you know, swap. Nope, don't care. Just shove a knife in better heart. It's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm I'm dying to like really branch out into that part of my culture. Yeah. It's like, what would it be like to play a Jewish hunter in Hunter the Reckoning? Oh, that that would be interesting. I like, like that. Like someone who like deeply believes in Judaic myths of golems and stuff like that whose holy symbol is a star of david and who the so who's like whole humanity and all of that is based on a deep and you know very loving faith mm -hmm. of the torah it would it would be that would be a rad concept personally yes i would love to do that because i yeah, hope you get a I, chance to because i'm like i need i want to see this <laughs> That would be rad. I want this now. But yeah, I no, I do believe that safe spaces are important. Being able to play yeah. who you are and have those mm -hmm. characters that are part of you is important. And that you just have everybody has a place to feel comfortable and let go yeah. because you have a chance to tell a story with a group of people. Which is and so telling special. that Yo, telling that story is so wonderful. The emotional moments, that time where the DM just sits back and watches people just do a scene. Oh, like like in uh, a Leverage Los Angeles. Yeah, with <laughs> uh, with Locke and Donnie, um, or the any kind of planning session. I might as well just get up and go into the kitchen. Um, <laughs> now, but kind of going off of that because um, we we touched on that, which was interesting because we. On Leverage Los Angeles, if you guys have not had a chance to check it out on Open Circuit Studios, the the group can be very. We're we're a newer group. It's 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 chaotic. It can it can change at the drop of a hat, a blink of an eye. Yeah. Yep. Um, now, I I did not know that. Also, too, we talked about like different things um, as far as like your you know in your journey, but you have autism spectrum disorder. Yes, and and. I'm interested because of the fact that you're no, I, I definitely, you know, as far as someone who is still learning because my nephew actually has autism and mm -hmm. I'm still learning about it, but you can't always tell, you know, assume or tell again, going back to like assuming things because you don't know what someone's experiencing. How is that as far as being a creative and especially with like DMing and even being a player, how, how have you been able to navigate that? Cause I, I think that that's something that a lot of people, especially I feel like in, uh, the nerd space, I, I've been seeing more people kind of coming out and saying, you know, I have autism, I have ADHD, different things, and, you know, I'm, I'm learning how to navigate each and every day. Uh, thankfully, I have a uh, wonderful therapist and a uh, array of medication that keeps me, you know, somewhat balanced. Um, but yes, I, when I was diagnosed as an adult, uh, it was formerly uh, and horribly named Asperger's syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's um, uh, high functioning on the autism spectrum or autism spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. um, I also have probably, I would say, medium to semi severe, depending on what it is, uh, OCD and different tics. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, playing with the rings on my right finger. Um, <laughs> Um, and I'm also, again, bipolar one rapid cycling. Mm -hmm. I like order. I have, I have, for example, leverage Los Angeles. <laughs> I have outlines. I have the stats of every principal character that you may or may not even run into. I have outlines of general areas. So for example, last night when the meeting was, uh, when it was called to be held at the spare room, I had already chosen that in case they're like the, the team was going to uh, drop in on a meeting or anything like yeah. that. And you had the maps I, ready to go. Like you were dropping them in the chat. And I was I, just like, I have, this is insane. This is I so have folders detailed. and bullet points and all of that. But as every storyteller knows and dear God, how yeah. many times it's happened over 40 <laughs> years, Player agency and dice rolls screw the living shit out of plans. Oh, they do. They do. So oh, last night, 
last night I literally saw mentally literally saw my outlines and then I looked on my monitor where I have them all and just watched them poof and I had no contingency for the things that happened oh my goodness I do now because I spent <laughs> four hours last night going fuck it but in those <laughs> moments I fall back on my own coping mechanisms that I've had all my life that I just thought were my quirks. Mm -hmm. But it was because I was undiagnosed for a majority of my life. I was diagnosed in 2011. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And that's still fairly recent. Yeah. It's only 11 years ago, almost to the day. It was September 2011. No, August, August 2011. Um, and I didn't believe it at first until I came home and I bought $700 worth of uh, psychology books and um, uh, like different stories on autism. And I'm blanking on her name because I have aphasia now, thanks to the stroke. Um, Temple Grandine, I have her entire collection of books. And then I looked and after I bought it, I looked, I'm like, fuck, I really am. Okay, that was obsessive of me. Um, I go back on my coping mechanisms. I will try and unstim. So last night I had my hands on my temples, both in a thing of exasperation and also a this pressure here. I focus on the pressure and it makes my thoughts clearer and I'm able to think. Um, when I'm nervous, I play with my rings on my finger. I always have two rings because they click. And it just makes, it's kind like of calming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm doing that all those moments. So I come back on those coping mechanisms. Yeah. And I get through it. Because I've gotten through worse. It's okay if a story doesn't go the way you plan. When you read a book and suddenly there's a plot twist. Or you see a movie. Yeah. And the guy that died in the first act is back in the third. You're like, whoa! <laughs> it's the same thing. It's a narrative story. Yeah. I get it into my head that. What I am doing, it's ultimately not my story. It's yours. I'm just the book binding holding the whole thing together. And there will be plot twists of die rolls. There will be character yeah. play, player agency. And I just remember that it's your story and I have no control. And I kind of just let go. And, I, and I'll deal with it later. There have been times where that happens in the middle of a game and I immediately start. So big secret, storytellers, if something goes sideways, do a quick look around and oh, come good. up with names. Like, for example, you're in a tavern. What's the tavern keeper's name? Um, Caldwell. Caldwell is his name because I look and I have a um, uh, I have a uh, uh, rifle shooting rest that I use for cleaning my rifles immediately to my left. So I just look down Caldwell. His name is Caldwell. And he is a bard who is a gray skinned tiefling. And yeah, and that's it. Boom, 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 boom. That's good to know. So like if yeah. I, cause everyone's like, you, sh you, you don't check it out. You can do, you can GM, you can totally do it. And I'm like, you can so totally scared. do it. I'm so scared of it. But then I'm like, these tips that I've been getting from all of you guys, it, it's like, okay, you could, it's just about breathing. Take a look around. Yeah. Like these little things are so yeah. helpful that you wouldn't necessarily automatically think, especially if you're newer to trying to DM or GM, it can be very take your, intimidating. Yeah. Take your time to prepare the world that it's happening. Come up with lore and all that. But when it comes to the players, bullet points, man. Oh, yes. You don't have to diagram every single alley of a city. Unless you're one of those kind of immersive DMs. Yeah. Then totally fucking do it. But find find your lane of comfort and, and do that. Because good players will understand. Caring players will understand. Other DMs that have been there will understand. Yeah. We all have our way. We're all not Brennan. We're all not Matt. We're all not Abria. We are our own people doing our own types of tables. Oh. So if 
you want to do the full custom, uh, you know, Hero Forge, uh, you know, printout with Dwarven stuff and all that, <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Me, I don't even use a virtual tabletop in my games. If I need a battle map, I make one real quick on Owlbear Rodeo and send them the link and then they all log in. I don't use Foundry. I don't use Roll20. Mm -hmm. I don't use Tabletop Simulator. I don't do any of that. One, because my computer can't handle it. Two, because that is a nest, that, that, that's an overstepping thing for my own personal boundaries. Mm -hmm. I don't need a 3D environment in Tailspire. I need a couple of round tokens with a character's face on it and like a shitty picture of a black dragon. But that's just me. And, and my players so seem to like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that's so yeah. important to remind, because I think I, I, I have definitely heard uh, in my own personal journey, as far as people feeling the pressure of like having, especially if they're telling a story, like I, I want to tell a story that's as good as, you know, a, a Matt Mercer or a Brennan or what. And it's like, no, in the end, you're telling your own unique story with these, yeah. amazing players that you have at your table mm -hmm. and that that's the fun that's where the fun lies and not being anyone else but yourself which is it, sometimes it's it, it, it can be hard to like kind of shut your brain off and you know off of that wavelength but it's oh, yeah. important to remind yourself of that and that's so i'm yeah, glad that you and, are mentioning that it's important yeah and and you know work with if you're neurodivergent work with that if you need fucking bullet points on every major NPC that they will have, go for it. Like, absolutely mm -hmm. find your comfort zone and use it. I love you that. Know, it says, yeah. uh, Robert said, also be like 100% ready to admit you forgot something or got it wrong. Like, oops, you're right. The daughters did go to play over there and the parents didn't want them hearing bad news. I forgot. Would you like me to call them over now? Oh, 100%. Like you that. 100 fucking percent. If you think you are an infallible DM, you are a fucking liar. If you cannot say to your players' faces, shit, I got that wrong, I'm sorry. If it's like a plot point, something like that, or if you forget that someone would have been overhearing or someone's not, if you get their plans wrong, 100% own up to it. Yep. Don't immediately, like if somebody challenges you on a rule, talk it over. Don't immediately go, no, my rule's my table. Talk it over for a minute and just go, well, you know, I'm doing it this way, mm -hmm. you know, and that talk, communicate, don't sense. be a rules lawyer. Don't be, don't subscribe to a fandom, be a fan. There is like, there's a massive difference, but have fun on, fun. The, as it says on the tin, fun. yeah, when it, as it says on the D and D tin, the world's greatest role-playing game. That's it is it. a game. That's it. Misty Mountain Gaming. You know, diehard dice are made for games. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a fucking game. Have fun. Yes. And yeah, if you make money doing it, fuck right on, man. <laughs> awesome. But it's a game. And whether it's with strangers or friends, have a good time. Yes. Put in a little fantasy, put in a little horror put a little you know make them laugh make them cry do emotional moments do you know very mechanical moments yeah, get crunchy with the dice if you want to i love the but, mandy said having fun is how you win at ttrpgs i could yeah agree yeah that. yeah it's a game without winning you yep. don't win if you get to 20th level congratulations there's still more to do it's like sure you become an elder in vampire does it stop there no yeah. You lose your you lose your mental facilities in Call of Cthulhu. What if you then become a cultist and you come back in a different game? It's a story. It's the never ending story. Da -da -da, cue music. Um, <laughs> credits. But yeah, roll credits every time we say leverage. Roll credits. But yeah, yeah, it's just it's one of those things, man. That especially in this sphere right now, so many people are looking at at the big tables and yeah there is you know 18 to 20 of the same people on all the same tables that's because they're good at what they do but you're never necessarily going to be them it's your table you're not on c you're not at cr's table you're not at d20's table yeah. 
if you end up there, fuck right on. Yeah. But that's not your table. Make it your table. You are someone special telling a special story about things that you care about, believe in, or want to have that story told. I love that. Yep. You know, gain your inspiration from any source, like Blade Runner, Cyberpunk, Leverage, anything like that. 19, 1980s fucking Stranger Things, <laughs> kids on bike stuff, yeah. Tron, who knows? But get that and run with it. Oh, yes. Because don't try and be someone else. Be you. Now, everyone will be happier and you sure as hell will. Oh, yeah. Now, I want to because of the fact that we are now. Oh, my gosh. This, it went by too fast. It went by too fast. But what happened? What? We're already oh, basically. Oh, you know, the, we're, oh, we're no. towards the end of the show. But I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Because I absolutely love this. I said I, I need to get this last one in this last oh, question. Because okay. it's something that I've been loving. And you've already been giving some really great advice. Uh, to to and I'm sure I see I see the chat going off. They and I, I'm sure they agree. But I want to know what is the best advice you were given that stuck with you? Um, was it what you basically have mentioned, or was there something else that really really stuck with you? Because I've been asking everybody so far, and I like at least throwing this question in because everybody has some good nuggets of wisdom that I hope that the the viewers really really take to heart and and. and you know, it just impacts them in a, a positive way. It's like the series of questions at the end of like in the actor's studio, in the GM studio. <laughs> um, I'm like, this is the one, only one question that I'm like, for sure, I always have to try to ask. Um, I've had a couple really good ones. Um, one of the first ones was from my uncle. Um, he decided, I mean, I was I was a kid and he decided to run me through the grind core that is the Tomb of Horrors D&D module. It is designed to kill characters. That's what it is. And my thief didn't check for traps, pulled the thing out of the wall, got and got killed by poison. I'm like, fuck. And I got angry. Yeah. Um, and he says, dude, don't ever be afraid of screwing up as a character. Because you can always roll a new one. Or... You can always be brought back somehow. Mm -hmm. And that immediately calmed me down to the point where I'm thinking, yeah, what if I bring in his brother who's looking for his body? Ta-da! The story never ends. Yeah. And another piece of advice that I got, and it's not necessarily a piece of advice, but it's it was a reminder Uh and it's from Sinner's Dream on Monday and DM Chuck. Just don't be afraid to laugh. Whether you're on stream or off stream, if fucking something funny happens, just let go. Because it's fun. <laughs> Have fun. Yes, if you are on a stream that is trying to make money, you are presenting a product. Yes. That does not mean that that product can't be fun. For sure. Yeah, you could be on a stream that has bullet points from the storyteller saying, uh, this is kind of where we're starting and this is kind of where we need to end. There are a lot of streams like that. Mm -hmm. Have fun at the parts in the middle. Have fun, laugh, enjoy yourself. I know, I can't, it's hard for me to keep it, especially with leverage. I like, it's just like so many shows. Well, that, I will break, just a chaos I will break, fest. yeah, I will break character in a minute and I'm just, oh, sorry guys. Shit, yeah. I'm so sorry. Cause if, it, if it's just a line that gets me, I'm just, I'm trying so hard. I'm like, I'm sorry. I just, I got to let it go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so fun. But like yeah, that's, said. that's the thing. It really is. And there are times where before the stream even goes live, we have Chuck just doubling over in laughter. <laughs> and then like it comes on and he's barely squeaking out. What's up party people as the stream is live for like 30 seconds. And it's us just going off and Chuck laughing. Because that's just the negative two charisma way. Negative yeah. two charisma for a reason. Um, but it's, yeah, it really is. It dives down to that. It's just have fun. I've had my home game for two years with my friends. And I've put them through the blender of emotions. But as long as they're having fun, I know I'm doing a good job. 
And yeah, look after your people, have fun, and don't be afraid of your characters dying. Yeah, you love them. But remember, if your characters die in a very thrilling way, mm -hmm. it just adds more to the story. That's, that's so perfect. Thank you yeah. so much. I no, am so sad you. we are out of time because I could just continue this conversation. I can always <laughs> come back. That is exactly what I was going to propose. So we will have to try to plan that for you to come back and for us to chat about more awesome stuff because we didn't even touch on the fact that you're a creative director for uh, a certain geeky jersey. <laughs> thing <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah there's there's that whole thing but um, um if yeah. you can um i would love before we uh wrap things up uh if you just again let everyone know and i'm going to put in the chat as well where they can uh, find you and if there's anything coming up that you want to shout out just so that way they Ooh. can show you support also two guys uh i did include uh trevor's uh, co uh coffee because of the fact that literally oh, a few mm, days ago yeah. his car was broken into so i would love if you guys you know have anything you want to spare to kind of contribute towards that because obviously it's his birthday and that is a bummer that that happened literally before your birthday so yeah, two days ago <laughs> i can't believe that it and sucked. that really is sucky and we know how much it costs for any window repairs it, it's a pain it happened to us in koreatown it's not fun oh it's yeah not fun, no guys. it's not fun but on um, a positive note, on a positive all of note, your awesome stuff that we can look oh, for. I, I do a lot and I kind of am a lot. I'm sorry. Uh, again, Trevor Valley, paleontologist, pro DM writer. I'm the dinosaur specialist on the Prangia fifth edition uh, setting that's coming out from Atlas Games, creative director of the official Wizards of the Coast Dungeons and Dragons lines of jerseys from Geeky Jerseys. I can be found Mondays on A Sinner's Dream, Mac the Minotaur Gunslinger on Negative 2 Charisma. Uh, Tuesdays, Become Legend, the uh, League of Legends Arcane-inspired ultra-modern 5th edition game on the Free Forge. Wednesdays, at least for the next two weeks, because we're coming up to the finale, Ooh. I am the storyteller and director of Leverage Los Angeles on Open Circuit Studios. Thursdays, you can also, you can find me again on Negative 2 Charisma doing Quest the Cougar Live, the scum and villainy campaign about space, uh, the worst punk band in space. And Fridays are my uh, my private DM, uh, Saturday, Fridays and Saturdays are my private DM. So if you want a one shot or something off, let's talk rates. You can find me on Twitter at Tattoos and Bones. And uh, yeah, don't be afraid to reach out. The coolest thing though, is Monday. Monday, I will not be on negative two charisma and sinner's dream. We're moving that to Tuesday because Monday, I have the honor of doing a Halloween one shot, Ooh. a kids on bikes Halloween one shot with the crew from Perception Studios. Oh my gosh, it's going to be so good. Puppets, horror, kids on bikes. That's all you need to Six, know. 6 30, uh, 6 30. PM Pacific time yes. on percep on Perception Studios, and I am gonna have wait wait till you see who the villain is. That's all I'm gonna say. Ooh, I'm so excited! <laughs> it's amazing! Oh my but goodness! Yeah, if you guys, if any of you also want to ever reach out and talk about being neurodivergent, being a cancer survivor and fighter, yes. being anything like that, let me know. I'm I'm an open book and. You know, I'm a decent listener. So, yeah, there you go. Thank you so much, Uthime, for having me no, on here. Thank you. It's so much fun. It, this was amazing. And I loved just getting to, to sit down with you like this and to, for, for you to be able to share with us and be so open with us. I truly, truly, truly appreciate it. And, uh, I hope you have the best birthday ever today. Um, I want to thank everyone who was in chat. Uh, thank you so much for all of the, the positivity and the good vibes in chat. I see all of you guys and, and your questions as well. Thank you so much. Uh, just a reminder, we are not done with Power Word Talk because we have no. another special edition of our Power Word Talk that's going to be over on twitch.tv Sirenscape. So we're going to be uh, talking with Rob's amazing team, Sirenscape, which includes Ellen Graham, Rocket Fox, 
DM Brando and uh, Phil Harker Smith. We're going to be chatting about their uh, awesome campaign that you guys have been on the edge of your seats about and uh, just kind of learning more about their characters and what maybe is in store. <laughs> for each and, of them and, and sirenscape yes. is so fucking cool i know it's it's so, so cool. much fun especially being able to do all the little sound effects during the game oh, so sound effects fun. music atmosphere yes. so rad yes. so rad and that's 4 p.m pacific time over on sirenscape's channel so please please take a break get some snacks then come back and join us over there and then Shake also it off. um it off. friday don't forget we have gm raven who raven is also over on open circuit studios for a special vtm uh, uh, show over there uh, but she is going to be running uh, that cyberpunk high riders game with her amazing cast 5 p.m pacific time friday tomorrow so be sure to tune in for that as well uh but seriously this has been so amazing and i'm so so happy that we got a chance to have you on and hopefully not the not the last time that's what i'm hoping you'll be back on soon give me a day <laughs> and i'll make it work yes Woo. all right thank you guys so much and hope to see you over at sirenscape at 4 p.m pacific time thank I'm you i'm totally gonna be in chat for that yay until next time guys which is soon Bye. Bye. Which is soon. Very soon. Bye. 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 Bye.